so hi guys i'm uh, krishanu here and um, a little bit of background of mine i have been working uh, as a mechanical engineer for 11 years more than 11 years now and uh, most most of my work has been uh, across uh, in the in the medical industry although i have worked in other sectors also quite a bit but uh, a majority of my work has been in the medical devices sector and in the amount of time i spent in uh, the med- medical devices sector i've spent a majority of it working on ventilators and uh, that's that's why i'm here today just to take every one of you through through the basics of ventilator and understanding uh, the nitty gritties of it and why uh, it is it is a difficult a very difficult engineering challenge to have right so so to begin with uh, let's let's start from the agenda here on so so we are basically going to look at the types of ventilators that are there in the market so this is going to be a very broad perspective of ventilators we are not looking at uh, ambulatory or uh, transport ventilators here just just the kind of ventilators you would find in a regular hospital and after that we're going to look at uh, the ventilators that uh, would be needed uh, in the current covid situation and uh, and what are what are the problems that you you face and then how how you could be treated for that right and then uh, we'll take a deeper drive into the working of of the icu ventilators where we, we i'm going to take you through uh, how each module works and why is it needed and stuff like that and then we will go through the different mechanical ventilation modes in which you will have uh, the kind of uh, modes that a ventilator needs to run on and the kind of sensors that are needed for it and how an electronic control needs to be in to handle all these modes and most importantly last but not the least the lung trauma that is caused by ventilators so this is going to be a very basic overview of the kind of damage a ventilator can do to the lungs and uh, anybody who's even thinking of uh, making a ventilator should have this as uh, one of their you know most prior uh, you know highest priority information and they need to be very wary of how a ventilator can damage lungs so going on from here so the uh, if you go back in history ventilation started from something known as a mapleson circuit a lot of you guys find uh, the ga- ambu bag or the gamma bag everybody talks about right now and uh, this mapleson circuit is nothing but a just an uh, elaborate balloon with a couple of nrvs and you have uh, a fresh gas inlet if you can see here so fresh gas is nothing but a combination of uh, oxygen air and little about little bit of anesthetic agents if if needed so this circuit is primarily used uh, when the patient is uh, you know fully in coma and cannot breathe at all or uh, anesthesia uh, say uh, anesthesia induced coma is there uh, so he cannot at all breathe so you they, they pump fresh gas in to ensure that the coma state is uh, always there and uh, the ambu bag is um, is pressed by the uh, respiratory therapist or whomsoever is doing it and uh, this is this is a state where a patient cannot breathe at all so from here uh, the ventilators uh, basically graduated to the anesthesia ventilators that you can see in the right side <coughs> so <coughs> so most of these anesthesia ventilators are a better version of uh, the mapleson circuit and they basically are used to uh, uh, ventilate patients who are uh, you know under anesthesia so as 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 the word says right uh, that the anesthesia ventilators will use be will be used on patients who are completely on in coma or undergoing surgery and they they have no breath of their own at all and uh, they have all uh, pressure monitoring uh, volume monitoring and all the other uh, essential monitoring systems that uh, an, an ot needs to have and uh, it ensures that the right percentage of anesthesia keeps going into the patient during surgery and uh, the anesthetist whomsoever is there can sit on on the table that you can see there 
and have a look at all the parameters and keep the patient alive during during the surgery so that's that's basically the job of this ventilator it's 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 to ensure that the patient is always uh, you know in coma during the surgery and also to ensure that the uh, patient is alive by checking all the vitals and whether everything is fine or not right and uh, the most advanced version of it the the broad spectrum of the most advanced version of it is the right most you that you see they're called icu ventilators and these ventilators are used on in your regular icu where you see uh, either a patient can breathe completely or they are they are uh, they basically give assist to breathe to a lot of patients so these uh, these ventilators basically even detect and understand how a patient is breathing and uh, try to mimic their breath and uh, try, try to ensure that uh, a patient can be weaned out of a ventilator so basically a lot of patients would be in coma and uh, they would take time to uh, to first they will take ventilator support and slowly 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 they have to be removed removed from the ventilator so the it, it's it's only this icu ventilator that is capable of that kind of a functionality uh in ventilators so uh coming to the next topic uh, what kind of ventilator is needed for uh, this current covid situation right so a lot of patients whom you see uh, are tested for covid positive and need ventilation nowadays uh, covid usually induces something called as uh, ARDS which is acute respiratory distress syndrome and uh, that can be mostly tackled with an icu ventilator and uh, the other the mapleson circuit and uh, anesthesia ventilators can only be used in case of these patients being sedated under anesthesia and you induce coma and then you give them that ventilator but however uh, if you if you have to get them out which is a, like uh, which is a most amount of time so uh when you sedate a patient and give them anesthesia ventilator or the mapleson circuit after after you get, you take him out of sedation you have to slowly bring bring him to full consciousness and he should be able to breathe 100% on his own so so when this uh, phasing out of the ventilator comes you need to always ensure that the icu ventilator is the one that can do it because that will be the one that will be tracking and monitoring the breath and changing its mode as per as as per what the patient needs so i think i've pretty much covered uh, the assisted ventilation here uh, in my previous uh, discussion over here and uh, weaning patients off the ventilators is just what i'm saying so icu ventilator is something that is needed to ensure that you can you know you can take patients off off of a ventilator after that uh, the next very important requirement from patients for patients suffering from ARDS is a requirement of peep so peep stands for positive end expiratory pressure so this is the amount of pressure that is always kept inside the lung when you are doing when when you are getting mechanical ventilation this is this is very important for ARDS patients uh, so that the lung walls and the alveoli walls do not shut in on themselves and uh, if they do it becomes very difficult uh, to uh, to reopen them because the lungs and the uh, the lung walls and the alveoli walls also will have some percentage of uh, edema some amount of edema and that edema is usually sticky and the moment both walls uh, both walls of the lung and the alveoli come together what happens is uh, it is very difficult to reopen them again and you need a very high requirement of peep in case of ARDS uh, subsequent slides will uh, give you more of an understanding of the alveoli and why uh, peep is needed especially for ARDS the next point over here is uh, this ventilator icu ventilator needs to have some amount of intelligence uh, and some amount of uh, sensing uh, sensing the reaction of the patient and uh, when a patient gives gives breathing effort right so when a, when a patient gives breathing effort this this ventilator should be able to sense it and also try to synchronize his breath with with the breaths given by the ventilator if if you don't do that you 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 induce a lot of 
other kind of problems in the lung, majorly barotrauma and volume trauma that you're going to, again, uh, I'll explain this uh, in one of the next slides. So we need to be very, very careful. And these, these ventilators are, are des designed to be very sensitive to what patient is doing. And only then they can uh, respond. And not only that, th this whole ventilation circuit that goes, goes into a lung need, needs to be completely leak proof. That's, that's why you see those who, are, those who need um, uh, ventilation of, of this level, usually they need something known as an invasive ventilation where they have an ET tube and they basically put a tube down your trachea and then, and then uh, there's a balloon that blow, blows up close to your lung and uh, what what that ensures is there's whatever amount of uh, gas exchange is happening this gas exchange happens uh, in a completely leak leakage free way uh, leakage is is the enemy of any ventilator and it it always throws off calculations by by a long time uh, by by really far and and it, it it causes a lot of damage in 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 the patient's lungs so we we need to be very careful and there are a lot of standards to ensure that that whatever circuits that are there and the internal circuits that are there they are completely leak proof so that the ventilator sensors work in a very uh, in a way that is reliable and then last but not the least um, this the particular standard for critical care ventilators is ISO 8061-2-12, and this is a particular standard for the ventilator, and uh, you need uh, you need to follow this standard uh, to get to get into to get Europe EU marking, CE marking, and even uh, FDA clear certification. Also, uh, right now. Uh, in the Indian market, if you look at uh, ventilators are not a regulated product and this standard right now is not needed to call out uh, to, to make a ventilator. But uh, it is in the works and ventilators in India will still become regulated. And if they put this standard uh, as a minimum requirement, then it would make a lot, uh, it would make ventilators a lot more complicated and uh, it would need a lot more safety uh, safety precautions to ensure that whatever ventilation happens happens safely so if you can see on the right top of the slide over here you can look at uh, lung capacity and tidal volume inspiratory reserve volume expiratory residual volume so before we go on to our next uh, slides uh, just to give you a little background these these are terms that you will use you will see me or hear me use pretty regularly so the total lung capacity is pretty straightforward you know the total volume that a lung can carry during uh, normal operation right and a part of that total lung capacity would be residual volume that will be when the lung completely collapses and completely exhales there will be some amount of volume of air still in the lungs so that is what is called as residual volume and then you have uh, expiratory volume so from the residual volume to uh, the amount uh, of uh, volume that uh, you need to inside to keep hold of peep that you can see your positive end expiratory pressure is called the expiratory reserve volume and uh, on top of it you have the inspiratory reserve volume where you say the amount of buffer ventilation keeps ventilator keeps knowing that uh, your uh, knowing that your uh, uh, inspiratory reserve volume starts uh, you know uh, buffer that a ventilator keeps so basically then we go on to the tidal volume right so this is something that you listen to a lot of ventilator manufacturers and designers always talk about so tidal volume is the volume per breath that a ventilator can give to a patient and this tidal volume necessarily is never the complete lung capacity or it's not even the total lung capacity minus uh, minus the uh, uh, residual volume this this is always uh, less than the, the the reserve lung capacity just to ensure and reduce the ch chances of volume trauma on the patient and the tidal volume is always uh, prescribed by a respiratory therapist or a pulmonologist or uh, whomsoever is the expert in that field so let's uh, get into 
one of the workings of the ventilator over here. Uh, you can see uh, the ventilator predominantly has two inlet lines. One is air and another is oxygen. And both of them get filtered uh, before they enter the ventilator and both of them need to be 100% dry. So the major, this is the major requirement for any ICU ventilator. And uh, I, I think why it needs to be clean is very you know, understandable to anyone. But why they need to be dry is because any amount of humidity is going to uh, hamper the working of any of the electronic sensors that you see along the line. And these sensors, mind you, need to be very, 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 very sensitive. So uh, the air and oxygen enters through the filter and uh, they usually enter at a pressure, uh, pressure of 60 PSI and they need to be dropped down to a pressure of around 50 to 60 centimeter of H2O. Now from 60 PSI to 50 to 60 centimeter of H2O is less than one PSI. So it's a huge drop in pressure and uh, from industrial standpoint, from sensing standpoint, sensing anything less than one PSI is, is very difficult and getting very, very accurate sensors is very, very difficult uh, in, in, in that range. So the, you can also see there would be an electronic pressure sensor before the regulation happens. So that, that basically uh, connects to your, uh, to, your micro, to your microcontroller or, or um, your electronic circuits to ensure that if the pressure, inlet pressure drops below a certain amount of limit, it, it shuts down the ventilator and ventilator throws up an alarm that, hey, there's no enough pressure, not enough pressure in the line. And, you know, we cannot ventilate the patient with the amount of pressure you're giving. So once the pressure regulator uh, brings it down to uh, 50 to 60 centimeter of water, usually uh, there's no regulator that can accurately bring uh, uh, that can accurately bring down the pressure from 60 psi to 50 centimeter of H2O sub one psi in one stage. So you usually have two two pressure regulators working in tandem. So one of them brings it from 60 to two psi, and another one brings it from two to uh, sub one PSI. So the usually the later uh, regulator is more expensive since uh, those those pressure ratings are not seen in the market and you do not have enough demand and also they are bigger and clunkier and more difficult to manufacture. The, those regulators would be more expensive. After that, once you've regulated the pressure to a certain level, you need to get into flow control where you basically control the amount of flow that is going into the uh, into the patient. So in, in both of these cases, you need very high fidelity valves and these valves also can, uh, you know, can control the flow in, in milliliters per second, in less than milliliters, like or the, some of them will have very low resolutions, like of you know, 0.5 ml per second or something like that. So when, uh, when you have such high resolutions that are needed for these valves, these valves also can, can get incredibly expensive and in impossible to manufacture in, uh, in, in, in many setups. So they would need clean rooms and they would need very high finishing to be, uh, to, to get that kind of a fidelity. After that, you get uh, a flow sensor. A flow sensor here is nothing but a, uh, to all mechanical engineers out there, they would know it's just a venturi and it measures differential pressure. It has got pressure sensors in two different places and it, uh, and it detects minute change in pressure. And then based on Bernoulli's theorem, it can calculate the amount of flow that is happening through the ventilator. After that, this comes into something known as a, both oxygen and air comes, comes into something known as a mixing block. This mixing block uh, is where the mixing, of course, happens between air and oxygen. And uh, there is some amount of challenges involved over here as well. So this here, basically the problem is the specific uh, weight of ventilator of air and uh, oxygen are very different and uh, the specific gravity, sorry, the specific gravity of uh, air and oxygen are very different and uh, they do not want to mix that easily. So when you put, although you put air and oxygen, it, 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 it doesn't form a, uh, homogeneous mixture. It forms a heterogeneous mixture. And the danger of this being that there may be times when the first, uh, I mean, if you get, if you give the patient 10 breaths, maybe three of them would be 
50 60 percent oxygen and three uh, and uh, remaining seven of them would be like very low less in oxygen so both cases are not good uh, i think uh like sending less less oxygen will uh, ensure that the pair the, the patient you know uh i mean he doesn't get enough oxygen and he ga- gasps and uh, if you have uh, more oxygen going to the patient that also leads to a lot of medical uh, complications and uh, they end up you know burning your trachea or the bronchi and they they cause a lot of excess amount of oxygen also cause a lot of damage to the human body so once you have ensured that uh, in the mixing block that both air and oxygen are mixed homogeneously you uh, send it through a pressure oxygen cell and the oxygen cell is also known as an fio2 cell and the fio2 cell essentially measures the percentage of oxygen that is there and uh, ensures that the flow control happens in such a way that the amount of oxygen that the uh, that the doctor suggests is the amount of oxygen that's going to the uh, uh, patient so this is one and then the final piece is the emergency pressure relief so this is a mechanically set valve which is uh, which has no uh, you cannot set that valve this is preset by the manufacturer and left so this is there always to ensure that if there is any problem in, in in the whole ventilator and it's, if any of the electronics fail the, you should never have more pressure getting into the patient lung which would you know lead to a lot of lung damage and even death so this pressure relief always ensures that you know if this if there's a software has a bug or the electronics have malfunctioned any of the valves have malfunctioned that whatever it it basically releases all the pressure and gives only what is acceptable to the patient and uh, no surgeon or no doctor can uh, can even get access to this valve or it's neither settable by them so from here it goes to the patient and when the patient inhales and then he exhales out these gases so when this when the gases get exhaled you you, you come to the uh, orange side so you have it comes to the exhalation valve and and from the exhalation valve this exhalation valve is majorly uh, responsible for ensuring peep as what i had told in your pre- in the previous slide so this ens- this exhalation valve allows how much ever pressure above the set peep to go out and the uh, gas to go out but as soon as the the peep is reached by the patient uh, the pressure that is supposed to be there uh, within the lungs this exhalation valve basically uh, stops the breath and doesn't let the patient exhale fully and uh, the flow sensor here basically measures uh, the amount of air that goes out and the exhalation pressure sensor also measures the amount the pressure at which the patient is breathing out and based on that you can see there is some amount of small amount of air that is taken from uh, the input air line and this is controlled with the right right valves to ensure that whatever peep is set by the doctor is executed on the patient so you would have a uh, you would have a diaphragm and uh, you would just have a diaphragm and one side of it you have patient pressure and another side of it you have uh, the pressure given and set by the doctor so as soon as uh, the lung can overcome the pressure set by the doctor this valve basically just leaks out and then uh, also starts blocking once uh the pressure uh, set by the doctor and the pressure in the patient lungs are same you basically stop the breath so after this um, we get on to the breathing modes here uh there we go so there are predominantly four modes here so you uh, yeah, so you can see there is volume assist and control mode so in volume assist mode you you have a preset tidal volume and only that is what is an input taken from the doctor and other pressure curves and pressure uh, in uh, pressures are not controlled by the doctor the ventilator sets the pressure to ensure that uh, at what respiratory rate if you can see that's what 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 i mean by respiratory rate is the number of breaths per minute 
and uh, what breadth per minute is maintained uh, is maintained to give that amount of volume to the lungs of the patient and uh, also complete the breath so it it basically only controls the volume that goes into the patient and does not it just monitors the pressure and checks for uh, safety against excessive pressure but it does not control the pressure at all the second mode here is called the pressure assist control mode so this is basically inverse of the volume assist control mode so what happens here is uh, you uh, basically control the pressure and only pressure is controlled here and volumes are not controlled here so as soon as the lung reaches some amount of uh, pressure your uh, you know the ventilator switches to an exhalation mode and lets lets the uh, patient uh, exhale the air so the next mode that we come across over here is called uh, pressure support mode and pressure support mode is la is largely also done by icu ventilators and also there are machines in the market called bipap or cpap that can do this kind of ventilation so th this basically just supports whatever breath you are doing that it basically only gives you some uh, pressure that when a patient can breathe so this this basically just eases the method of breathing that he, the patient doesn't need to do too much effort to to have a breath last but not the least i think uh, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation along with pressure support so that this is usually called simv along with ps in the medical fraternity and why this mode is very very important is this is the mode where the icu ventilator basically synchronizes synchronizes with the uh, breath of the patient and then it it lets the it, it lets the patient breathe breathe and gives mandatory breaths to the patient as decided by the doctor so a doctor can basically say okay that i would give five mandatory breaths in a minute through the ventilator and the other breaths will be taken by the patient itself and the patient would be taking and this this mode over here will be basically monitoring all the uh, breathing characteristics of the patient and synchronize the breath as given uh, by the ventilator to the patient so in all of these ventilation modes let's let's get get into each of these uh, in a little bit of detail over here in the next slides so if you can see uh, the first mode over here is controlled ventilation and this controlled ventilation can be both pressure control and uh, volume control like i'd said in the last slide and this is something that you would see very commonly in an anesthesia ventilator as well so you would see that uh, in volume control mode you you would have a preset flow and the flow would keep increasing inside a ventilator till it reaches reaches some amount of peak and then and then the flow direction basically reverses that flow starts dropping here and then the uh, the flow comes comes back to normal when the breath is completed and similarly if you look at the pressure here if you see volume control ventilation you can see that both the pressure curves are different so the pressure here is not uh, monitored at all you can see the first pressure would reach some amount uh, beyond which the safety would cut it off and the next breath the same pressure is not reached but in volume control mode you can see that the volumes are always maintained and uh, the tidal volume given to the patient is always always the sa same across two to three breaths and once one tidal volume is met it allows the patient to exhale out and again uh, the tidal volume goes up and then again it allows the patient to ex exhale out in pressure control ventilation as well you can see the same thing happens but here you can see uh, your pressure is always constant whatever the doctor has set but the volume keeps changing the tidal volume that goes into the patient keeps keeps changing and before i go on to the next slide i would just want to say that this these slides are you know pretty much into the medical uh, uh, medical domain and electronic domain and uh, i am not an expert in that domain so i have basically referred to dr lokesh tiwari here whom you can see on linkedin and uh, taken these slides from one of his presentations and then we can get on to assist control ventilation so the pro the problem with the control ventilation before i go on to the assist is is that it is only time driven you can see that you know uh, here 
the uh, breaths that are given that is just given to a particular time duration that is set by the doctors with the number of breaths per minute so if the doctor is said set it to like 20 breaths per minute well, the ventilator will give the patient 20 breaths per minute so this control ventilation is always used when the patient is completely sedated and or in coma and cannot breathe at all uh, however when you come to the next stage of ventilation it is called assist control ventilation some uh, anesthesia anesthesia ventilators have it but most I, but it is this 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 feature is mostly there for icu ventilators and you can see here in assist control ventilation here the uh, here the ventilator keeps monitoring uh, the the breathing mechanics of the lung and once it keeps monitoring uh, the breathing and realizes that when a patient needs a breath and only gives a breath when the patient needs it so the doctor cannot you know set number of breath per minute or something like that here the patient will only be the ventilator will only you know respond to the effort of a patient so if you can see here uh, on the assist control ventilation pressure you can see pt triggered so you basically have a trigger you have a breath trigger so the more amount the moment the sensor of the lungs uh, in uh, that that is sensing the pressure in the lungs detect that there's a drop in lung pressure beyond a certain limit which is maybe 25 percent of the peep uh, it it basically decides that okay this is not the amount of uh, breath that a patient needs to have and uh, it starts giving a breath breath to the patient as against a time triggered one which basically doesn't take that any any input from the lungs so here uh, also i would say that uh, this this is not used uh, regularly on a patient who is fully conscious so this is used on a patient who is basically sedated or coma or in coma and or is trying to get out of coma so uh, this this is used in in this mode is used in those cases more often than not after that let's come on to pressure support ventilation so when you come to pressure support ventilation it is pretty uh, evident that uh, this if you can see the name itself says this is just support so this ensures that your patient is just uh, breathing breathing normally and this just aids it so if you can see here on this pressure support ventilation sli slide you can see that uh, whenever the patient uh, exhales and then inhales this pressure support ventilation just enhances the amount of inhalation that a that a patient does and then the patient doesn't breathe even the patient even the pressure support doesn't do any work and then patient exhales again and then when again he inhales he he, he inhales a lot more than what what he would do normally with his own effort so this this happen this is used when a patient is not having enough energy or his lung is not functioning enough to take in the amount of breath that is needed for him uh, to complete breathing cycle and ensure that his body is oxygenated enough and uh, although he can take breaths but the breath is taking a lot of effort and he's not able to you know uh, oxygenate his body enough so that is where this pressure support ventilation is is used and they are typically they are even given to homes these kind of machines they are called cpaps and bipaps as i told you earlier if you can go if you can see the first uh, first uh, image that i have over here uh, i don't know if you can see it properly but if you can see here during during the pressure breaths given by the ventilator you can see small breaths being taken by the patients over here so here if you can see uh, the patient is trying to take a breath but the ventilator is not helping and you can see a condition here where the ventilator has forced him to give a breath whereas the patient was trying to take a breath as well so th these are conditions where you basically end up damaging a patient's lungs because uh, either uh, he's trying to breathe differently that leads to barotrauma and also it leads to a lot of distress in the muscles around around the lungs of the uh, patient and because the patient is forced to breathe despite uh, all efforts of the muscles around his lungs so this is where a need for synchronous vent ventilation comes in that when a patient is trying to breathe you only basically give a breath then and you do not give a breath otherwise <clears throat> that is what synchronous ventilation means and 
coming to the next slide you have something called as simv so synchronous intermediate mandatory ventilation so here you can see where a doctor can do a trade off right with pressure support so where a pressure when when a patient is breathing you you just aid his breath with pressure support but during one of his breaths maybe uh, whatever the patient says uh, doctor says you know you need five breath a minute or eight breath a minute the ventilator synchronizes with the breath of the patient and gives a major breath with the help of the ventilator and then he uh, and then the ventilator keeps quiet and keeps monitoring the breath of the patient again for the next couple of breaths and again it it goes only when the patient is trying to breathe so this mode doesn't uh, come into uh, you know a picture otherwise this mode is also used with patients who have asthma and diseases like that where they are, they have a lot of effort to breathe they have to give a lot of effort to breathe and they keep breathing uh, and this ventilation just helps them with the effort with the effort so uh, coming to the trauma caused by the ventilators on the lungs so we have uh, first of all ARDS right so if you go back this is the same condition of the lungs that that is caused by even covid and even a ventilator can introduce ARDS as well the next one is volute trauma if you can uh, uh, bar sorry bar trauma so if you can see the right two images the uh, top and bottom images on the right you can see that if the alveoli over here is closed uh, completely and uh, you're you're just giving him too much pressure giving it too much pressure you would see that uh, the bronchi of the lungs would would start breaking in different it would bulge and just pop out or it would just you know shear out in this case and uh, this this amount of damage on the bronchi would also uh, would ensure that there would be more edema in the lung because the body will try to repair this by giving it some blood and energy to heal quickly so that is what happens and on the left side over here you can see how an alveoli works basically so you can see air comes in and the alveoli is is the sac around here and then you can see impure blood coming in and as soon as the air comes in there is a uh, osmosis happening here and the air basically goes sorry not osmosis diffusion diffusion happening here so air which has higher concentration of oxygen the oxygen gets into your uh, blood cells uh, impure blood cells and uh, they get oxygenated and the impure blood cells let out co2 which get into the alveoli and it's sent out to the uh, during exhalation so it, it's 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 in this alveoli where basically oxygen exchange happens and whenever you're maintaining uh, you're, you're giving mechanical ventilation it is of primal importance that this alveoli is always uh, you know is all is is not damaged because these these cell walls are very thin and uh, these walls that cause a diffusion are very very thin there you can see and uh, because of that uh, if you give excessive pressure or excessive volume they would rupture within no time so coming to volute trauma uh, over here uh, volute trauma is something that can, that happens over here if you can see right so if you if you give this alveoli too much of volume so you basically it's like a balloon and it you give it too much volume it 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 expands it expands it expands after some time it just pops open and uh, this pretty much uh, affects the membrane of the uh of the alveoli and uh, also it gives a lot of stress to the lungs and the lungs have many alveoli and they, i think uh, a few of them get i mean if not taken care all of them can get damaged with volute trauma and also there's uh, atelect trauma which is uh, if you if you let the alveoli wall stick like in this case and then you force it open multiple times even then this wall gets this wall gets damaged and uh, that is where the requirement of peep comes into the picture that i discussed earlier and uh, to ensure that that, uh, that doesn't happen you need to have some amount of peep and in ARDS the amount of peep is usually higher and uh, you ensure that your alveoli walls do not you know collapse onto themselves completely like like what is shown in this image and they al always have some amount of air inside them and lastly 
that uh, the amount, the ventilator can also cause pneumonia in patients and uh, the the primary response the, the primary thing that happens over here is because the internal circuits of of the ventilator are out of you know patient or sterilization requirements you put filter in front of them to ensure that uh, that circuit doesn't get uh, infected or uh, or uh, germs don't live there but however uh, no matter how many filters you put uh, there are something that escapes and uh, because of this it is very difficult to uh, clean the in in inlet airway pressure but however the exhalation ports that deal with more uh, patient output are can be sterilized separately that you know detachable and they can be sterilized separately but however in ventilators you have to be very very careful just to avoid cross infection <clears throat> i think uh, that's that's it from my side if you if anyone has any questions you can ask uh before i guess we compile any questions from people uh I, okay to to me this is like space tech right like right. literally too many complexities involved too many sensors and this is a complex setup that's out there uh and as you said that things can fail in any place and you have the safety wall at the end which just ensures in case yeah. of yeah. failure it just stops so like i i see it's it's complex and how even to make one how long does it actually take to make one of these and how how much of money is usually does it cost so um, if you if you're looking at development of a ventilator it 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 it'll, it'll, it'll easily go into years right if you're trying to start from scratch if you're if you're reverse engineering something or you have the design already uh it will take you less amount of time to uh make it but you, the cost involved will be very high you will you will have to source valves and you will have to make valves and manifolds and the amount of uh, you sh- you will need to have proper industry machines and uh proper setup and also have good source of these valves because these valves are traditionally very difficult to make and they because primarily because of most of these valves are made by hand right so the most critical valves here are basically finished by hand and then sent out so even the companies that are manufacturing them have a manufacturing limit to the amount of valves they can make and then when they send it out to to the companies and then they need to assemble it properly in a manifold and have a very good clo- clean room setup uh, where these valves get uh, manufactured and the setup cost and uh, and the the manufacturing cost of these will be will be very high it it it, it would go into crores even you know if you're trying to develop this okay uh what do you think about this whole open source ventilators that people are trying to develop with right so most alternative of, sensors yeah so most of these open source ventilators if i come back here they would work on any one of these control ventilation kind of uh, setup right and they can work very well uh, if the patient is sedated completely or is in coma and you have to keep him alive and there is no lung function at all and you just keep him alive so you have either lung volume control or you have pressure control so most of these low cost ventilators would do would essentially stop in this mode over here and um, if if you want to go beyond uh, anything beyond this mode like you know maybe uh, an simv mode or a uh, assist mode you would need like uh, we are talking about pressure sensors over here that that uh, that typically sense around 1 cm of h2o kind of pressure and in in engineering we know right that if you're trying to measure something it needs to be 1 tenth its least count needs to be around 1 tenth to 1 fifth of what you're measuring otherwise uh, what will happen is if your least count is more than 1 cm of water you would never get accurate and reliable values because your error is more than what you're trying to measure so you would never get good values so you need to get that, those particular sensors with around 0.1 to 0.2 uh, cm of water accuracy to be able to measure these kind of values and getting those sensors would be would would be tremendously 
cost expensive and also time consuming most importantly okay so some of these ventilators that people are trying to build will only be helpful in specific scenarios but covid in itself may not be not so no much. no in the, it it, it uh, i would just say it would not help in ards okay in fact if not careful these ventilators will cause ards essentially damage to the lung yes yeah interesting uh, i guess uh, there are not many questions out there uh maybe we'll redirect people to the comments if anybody has questions post the event you can actually post in the comment section of the page and we will redirect them to prashanu okay uh i guess we'll end it here it it was a really interesting talk i i, I guess i am not sure how many people in india are actually developing this but i do come across people trying to post images saying we're trying to do it like right uh, so i i see a lot of efforts um uh around the world even in india i see a lot of, i hear a lot of people even uh, contacting me but i just want to say this right so if if you're planning to make a ventilator i will not discourage you it's you know the more manufacturers of ventilator the better it is for humanity but it is you need to be be into it in in it for the long you know it's it's not something that you you can turn around in a couple of months yeah so i mean we have this uh, startup space in telangana called tea hub so there's some mm-hmm. it's kind of a maker space i guess they have this hardware division called tea works mm-hmm. uh so there are a bunch of folks who were developing one and they developed a prototype i guess they're testing it with the doctors but so yeah uh, i guess how do you test these i mean you right. did so you when you manufacturers but... so when you test one of these ventilators you need the first thing you need to do is you, you need to buy a lung simulator so any of the high end like any of the ventilator manufacturers have a lung simulator and uh, if i if i can get back to the slide right uh, there's this iso standard over here right so the iso standard calls for you to test it on that simulator and uh, when you buy that simulator and test all your modes on that lung simulator and ensure that all lung compliances and all lung conditions are uh, the ventilator is behaving to is proper and acceptable only then you can sell this ventilator in the market right so without a lung simulator i uh, even if you say a doctor is you know testing this untested ventilator on a patient it is basically unethical you should not be doing it uh i mean do we usually have lung simulators in like educational hospitals or... i don't think so because it's a very expensive uh, piece of equipment most of them most people think test lungs are lung simulators but it's not uh, uh, a lung simulator is a machine that can easily cost upwards of 10 lakh rupees and then it's very difficult to maintain because you have to send it out every year to calibrate uh, to the us or to whomsoever is the manufacturer of the simulator and then it goes to them and then they calibrate it and then they send it back every year year on year and uh, it's very expensive to keep and it's very expensive to maintain as well so that's 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 how you got to test a ventilator and it's it's very difficult like uh, designing a ventilator can take you between you know couple of years or three years and then you when you figure out the testing that will take another year or so okay quite time so i have one question from the audience he was like uh, there are these new uh, ventilator splitters like mask splitters oh yeah yes yes where they're providing one ventilator for multiple patients mm-hmm. uh, how how does that work so, so you have same synchronized breathing so long and short short of it is in most cases it does not work right so let me let me be very clear here but however there are few cases under which they work so if i can come come down here uh if you go to volume control and pressure control in these cases also they will work provided one of these splitters have some kind of a valve which uh, which controls the amount of volume that gets into different see basically when you put two different patients you got two different lung compliances and uh, if you're trying to do synchronized intermittent breath, breath on them it is impossible because a ventilator would not know which lung is behaving in which way and which lung is trying to breathe so it will become very difficult to do simv on them uh, pressure support is possible 
uh, is one of few things that's possible. Pressure control is possible, but pressure assist is not. And volume assist and control is also out of the picture. But pressure assist and pressure control is possible with the condition that both of these lungs have the same pressure and both of and compliance. And then whatever the splitter is can give two different volumes to the size of the lungs. Otherwise, you will need to look for lungs that will need same tidal volumes. And when it needs the same tidal volume, if you if you have a like if you have 10, 15 patients, you will not even get a single patient who has a, who need, who needs the same amount of pressure and who needs the same amount of tidal volume. It's statistically very low, so they would not help you in any way. So these are very few conditions where you can use these splitters. Okay, so it's it will help provided you have have these kind of ventilators and where you're also you you are controlling the flows yeah uh, which brings me into the question like how trained should a medical professional be to actually operate this right stump? so respiratory therapy is a field of paramedical in itself you you need a bsc or an msc to do it and even the pulmonologist and all they have to do your mbbs and they have to do your complete you know, masters and other things to be trained enough to understand enough to be able to handle a ventilator. So even nowadays in hospitals, right, the people, uh, those who are nurses and all, do not set a ventilator. It's these doctors, those who do, they come and set it. And then these ventilators, uh, I need to bring up one more point over here. Most of these ventilator handles patients for weeks and weeks and months, even years. We, we've all, always heard of patients who are there in the ICU for a year or two years or three years in coma. And then, you know, the pay of family, you know, cannot pay for the ventilator anymore and stuff like that. But this ventilator is supposed to be doing that. So can you imagine the amount of reliability that a machine needs to have to ensure that, you know, in a year, you can Im imagine this gives 20 breath in, in one minute. In one, one and a half years, how many breaths this machine gives? And all these breaths should be reliable all the time even if one breath goes wrong it kills the patient right so that much amount of reliability needs to be built in into these ventilators and that's that's what's very important for us over here it's it it brings out that most of this is like a very complex problem both in terms from a healthcare perspective and even from a tech perspective, whether yes. it's mechanical engineering perspective, rather, yes. I don't want to call it tech per se, but yeah, yeah, in yeah. terms of both mechanical and electrical. Uh, so I would want to bring, you know, one more thing in, into consideration over here. Making low cost ventilators is not something new, right? If, if people are thinking right now, oh, COVID has come and we, we have to make low cost ventilators. No, it's, it's not something that is new. Engineers have been trying for tens of tens of years to try to make something low cost and something more uh, accessible, but it's not possible. Many of the African countries, few of them don't even have a single ventilator and they have dealt with uh, pandemics like Ebola. And uh, like, for example, Nigeria, Nigeria has one ventilator, right? And it's, it's people are trying to make it for a long, long time now. And this is where you hit a roadblock where you say, oh, okay, this this is what the laws of physics allows me to do. And it, this is what laws of physics doesn't allow you to do. You know, it's, you cannot go more than the speed of light, right? I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's a phys physical boundary that you are fighting against over here. Okay, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Krishano, for explaining these basics of how ventilators work. I hope people understand what they are trying to do when they are attempting to build some of these and hope uh, more than pe more people also learn about this and more uh, medical doctors are also trained on these. And we'll end it here. If you have any more questions, please comment on our page and we will ensure that they reach Krishanu and we'll see if we can get it replied for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.